So uh, when we look at the topic, the first or the best place to start is where exactly we are right now. So to talk about waste management, the Indian scenario right now, I welcome Ms. Anu Agarwal, who is a national consultant from WHO India. Ma'am, the floor is all yours to enlighten us on this topic. Yeah, good morning, everyone. And thanks, Kaho, for organizing this. And it's good to be part of this. I would just start with giving a brief on uh, the history of biomedical waste. Because uh, a lot of people don't realize that we've come a long way from 96, where there was nothing for biomedical waste. And we found as an environment, I mean, I was working with an environment NGO. Uh, earlier and we used to find a lot of biomedical waste mixed up in municipal dumps and people used to really have a bad uh, time. Uh, we used to see cows, dogs, scavengers, they were all around the place. Rat pickers, very young. We've seen young rat pickers, very um, tender age of 10, getting AIDS and you know, the things were bad. So 96, we got the first draft rule. And this draft rule was basically a repercussion of an international movement. So there was Basel Convention, which tried to curb and control the transboundary movement of hazardous waste. So it was in this relation that the world realized that medical waste is an increasingly, uh, it's becoming a challenge. And the quantum of waste we were generating was increasing per day. And uh, the entire uh, world then sat together and Basel Convention was signed and medical waste stream was one part of it. As a signatory, when India signed the Basel Convention, the government realized that to align to this convention, we needed to have a biomedical waste rule. So the draft rule came, in, came out in 96, which had major problems. Firstly, the entire focus was on incineration that all 30 bedded and above hospitals should have an incinerator. And um, there was no alternative suggested. People thought that they just had have to install an incinerator, burn everything. The second, then there were a lot of uh, to and fro PILs were, were filed by NGOs. And finally, the 98 routes uh, was- uh, Your slides are not changing. Can you please change your slides? Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, this is like, you know, I'm just talking like. Can you please uh, uh, put it in slideshow? Yeah. F5, if you can press F5. Yeah, thank you so much. Sorry. So from that 98 rules uh, now to, I mean, we're in 2023, but this rule has been ever evolving. From the 98 uh, rules came about many amendments and then the rule itself was revamped in 2016. But we, uh, having worked in this sector for all these years, we see this uh, biomedical waste management rules as a banyan tree and uh, which has now evolved a lot of crop roots. These guidelines which are trying to support this big banyan tree because, and I think uh, seeing in terms of an environment person in all the waste rules, biomedical waste rules has been one of the best implemented rules in the country. And uh, the reason is, I think the, the audience, the people who are um, concerned in implementing are people who are working on health. So environment and health go hand in hand and no, anybody working in health understands the well-being of the environment. So our well-being is directly linked with the well-being of the environment. So this sector cannot work and cannot you know, fulfill its mission until you work for environment as well. So you will see this, this is from the CPC website. <clears throat> you know, for any problem that we had, we approached the government and you know, we came out with solution and this was in terms of a guideline like how to manage immunization waste came up in 2004. People, UNICEF and a lot of other multilateral bodies thought that incineration was the only option because there was no way to connect the PHCs and subcenters to the CTFs. But then 
because as a country we had banned on site inc incineration we thought that the country should stick to this thing and that's why this uh, universal immunization protocol guidelines came in in 2004 in india and they were remarkable in the sense uh, many developing countries are still looking towards these guidelines to replicate these in their own countries and similarly you will see a host of guidelines came in i mean when people realized on site systems were not working that centralized treatment facilities were required mercury was a problem then mercury guidelines came in and this journey is continuing so that's the reason of holding these workshop whenever people have problems on the ground because the type of waste stream in the medical sector it, uh, changes every day with new technology coming in new drugs coming in so the rules cannot be static they need to be they need to evolve with the need of this sector so the reason of having these workshops is to identify problems and gaps and any challenges people are facing on the ground bring that on board and take it to the policy level and bring about changes if it's a policy it's a amendment in the rules let that be if there's some supporting guideline that is needed i think we can all work to get together for that so this is a platform it's a bridge towards you know from the policy so we just act like a bridge between the implementers and the people who are enforcing the rules and the need for this all this comes from because you know this this data is we've been hearing about this data for last 30 years that 15% of hospital waste is hazardous but even in 2019 uh, a unicef and who uh, report said that one in three hcfs in least developed countries have basic only basic healthcare waste management facilities which includes only having bins segregation was absent in most of the facilities and this tells a sad story that you know there will there is some somewhere people don't understand the need of doing this and somewhere there's a gap of capacity because i've been uh, uh, while compiling uh, southeast asia and uh, south asia study we found that even a remote uh, district in pakistan they found that uh, when a capacity building exercise was had taken place there within a year that district performed much better in segregation than any other district in the country and better than even teaching hospitals in pakistan so that's the kind of impact i mean we were surprised to see that report but that's the kind of impact capacity building can do uh before uh, i just touch upon sustainability i would uh, like to uh, tell something about the rules because i see there's a lot of confusion sometimes about to whom does this rule apply to who all are who, who all are under it see uh, environment is the, a central subject it's a federal subject and it's under the union government of india so anything that is formulated by the center it is applicable to the entire country so all the waste management rules are made under the environment protection act of 1986 so they are same for all the for the entire country all the states have to follow the same rules and the same guidelines the another another difference is rules are mandatory no tweaking is possible guidelines are suggestive so guidelines you can play around with but rules you cannot play around with they are mandatory the uh, uh, other thing that people get confused is there is nothing about penalty occupier the definition of occupier so biomedical waste rules gives just a two three line definition of an occupier but that does not mean that there is not one very comprehensive definition of an occupier under the environment protection act the occupier definition is given in two three pages so it's worth reading that a lot of when you go and train nurses and ward by somebody sometimes they say ha to the medical superintendent is the occupier so that means anything that happens he'll be fine no you 
this is just a very superficial definition of an occupier. The real definition is in the EPA where all the people generating waste in that particular, because it's, it applies to the industry as well. So anybody who's generating the waste in that premises becomes an occupier automatically. So it's not just the head of the institute. Everybody, all of us are occupiers if we are generating waste. The other thing is the, what is the penalty? So the penalty is not given in the biomedical waste rules because it is given in the EPA. So any non-compliance, the just because see you are healthcare facilities, you are directly linked to the health of the people. People don't shut you down, but the pollution control board has the authority to uh, shut down the organization, uh, shut down, shut down the facility. They can cut your water, they can cut your power, they can fine you with one lakh rupees, with five thousand rupees extra for non-compliance each day then five years of imprisonment. So there's a, there are a lot of provisions. The PCB does not do anything to the healthcare sector just because you've got that positional power, I'll say. So, and that's the beauty of the thing that you guys are more responsible than the other sectors also. You are more responsible. But now because we now call it healthcare industry also, so you need to be more sensitive to issues. That's the whole point of these discussions. Now, when we talk of sustainability, the healthcare sector is a leading climate polluter and with healthcare's climate footprint increasing from 4.4% in 2014 to 5.2% in 2019. <laughs> this is really worrying because in India itself, I don't remember the exact figure, but the healthcare sector is growing at a tremendous rate. So now we can see the what so this projection is about a global projection where they say the healthcare emissions could triple by 2050. So you will beat maybe the shipping industry and the aviation industry as well. So you know where you stand. So minimum, when we talk, obviously this includes a lot of uh, footprint from water and energy, energy basically, and also the supply chain. Coming to waste management, I'll say this is also something which cannot be ignored. So we can, in a hospital, when we are sitting in a hospital, we should look at environment-friendly waste treatment and disposal and yellow bag, uh, yellow bag waste reduction, which comes from segregation and reduction and recycling also in the municipal. See, when we say that only 15% is hazardous waste, we realize that this in the same breath that 85% is general waste. So during the course of last 10, 15 years, our focus has been whenever we enter a hospital, see, biomedical waste is something you need to handle. But please take care that under you are an occupier also for municipal waste, for electronic waste, for battery waste, for lead waste. So all these waste tools are applicable to a hospital and you're accountable for it. So the moment you start managing your medic uh, the general waste also there's a lot of footprint impact that you can see now this is uh, i don't have any latest indian data so this is a data that uh, from a fact sheet that i did in 2013 but it's a very relatable data. So as an Indian, Indian healthcare people coming from Indian healthcare sector, you will, uh, because otherwise we have a lot of American data, but I don't want to share that. A 700 bedded hospital in Delhi, when we did a analysis for that, it can reduce its carbon footprint by 1300 metric tons carbon dioxide per year. So that was a huge number. And you, uh, this is uh, 10 years back. So this analysis was done by taking into account uh, how they were segregating all their municipal waste and all their biodegradable waste was being sent to piggeries and all the recyclable waste was being sent to a recycler. So there was a contractor who picked up all there. So basically they were in, in 
in what we call, we can call it a zero waste hospital because landfill diversion rate is 100%. Nothing from the hospital went to the landfill. And all the biomedical waste plastic was also segregated then at source, autoclaved and recycled, given to the recycler, which is not done now, it's being discontinued, but we assume that the CTF is doing that process. So India's medical sector, we calculated the, this was an estimate, that if entire plastic medical waste stream goes, this is only considering plastic. We haven't considered glass or metal. Only plastic alone can save an, around 2,72,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide per year. So all these small steps that we do in a hospital make, can make a big impact on the environment. And we're all part of it. Uh, next, I would just like to uh, share some of the confusion that I still have, and I see people also have some same confusions. What is on uh, the 48-hour rule? Now, the 48-hour storage rule, in 98, this rule applied to all the biomedical waste, all the categories. So, the rule read, no untreated, if you can see this, no untreated waste shall be kept stored beyond a period of 48 hours. Now, this is 98 rules, but if you see the 2016 rules, the clause has changed now to untreated human anatomical waste, animal anatomical waste, soil waste, and biotechnological waste. So this is all yellow waste category. Cannot be stored beyond a period of 48 hours. So this was done solely with the intent of any wasteful disposal of sharks waste container, PHCs and CHCs, which were connected to the CTFs, but the CTFs were not picking up waste daily. So they were given an option that, you know, at least they could store their plastic and sharks waste for a longer period, one week or 10 days till the CTF came in. But in hospitals in the cities, your sharps containers can stay in the hospital till they are three fourth full. You don't have to dispose it in within 48 hours. Now, containers for sharps is another thing which uh, on our rounds to the hospitals, we were really disturbed. Initially, then around 10, 12 years back, all the hospitals were easily using their plastic cans, all their, I mean, for disinfectant or whatever waste plastic cans they had, they were using it as puncture proof containers and the system was working pretty well. But now the same hospitals are coming back to us and then telling us that, you know, the auditors, the NABH auditors come and tell us, you can't use these, get a proper white, and they show it the pictures of, on the net, you know, get a white virgin puncture proof container, this is not, this, this will not do, and they put a red mark there. What we fail to understand is that, see, at one point, we are talking about resource utilization, sustainability, carbon footprint, climate change. And at the other point, when it comes in application, when it is in practice, we're always, you know, we give, there, another debate starts off, this is infection control. No, this will lead to this. How can anything, I mean, it's a, it's a plastic container. So this, these are some things which need to come somewhere in the guidelines and any container. It's not that you need to have any virgin PPC. So these things need to be mentioned and we're looking for the suggestions from you people. Any such problems that you face on ground, please connect with us, please share with Kahu and they are making a document and we'll take it up at a bigger forum. The other problem that I've seen during these workshops is spill management protocol. See, in, I mean, there are two protocols. Really. It's first is like clean and disinfect, and disinfect, and the other is disinfect and clean. People are going by what's happening on the on ground is clean, uh, disinfect, and clean. And we don't even know whether it's being disinfected because the protocol See, the CDC and WHO gives a protocol where you're supposed to first pour, uh, clean, wipe up most of the spill, blood or body fluid spill, and then 
after cleaning you disinfect the entire purpose of this is that you remove the load of organic material because in the presence of organic material see like the cdc in one of the statement it says a recent study demonstrated that even strong chlorine solutions may fail to totally inactivate high titers of virus in large quantities of blood but in the absence of blood these disinfectants can achieve complete viral inactivation this evidence supports the need to remove most organic matter from a large spill before final dis disinfection the only place where they say that you need to pour the disinfectant first is when there is a spill of any culture in the lab so i think these things at least in a in a, these things should come into the guideline saying that only the lab should have this protocol the rest of the hospital can easily follow the other way around so i think that's it from my side thanks a lot thank you so much anu ma'am it was a very enlightening uh, take on the practical aspects of the biomedical waste management it includes it you very aptly included what we are where we are currently at and what the uh, you touched upon the queries that a lot of people had in many of the workshops and what has been going through our mind also you have covered very nicely so i can't think of a better way of setting pace to the entire day's workshop thank you so much i know